Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Sorry about that. I was held up in the hallway track for a bit. So that's a reminder. You can hang out during our breaks, go over to the hallway track. I was just talking with Warner about pre-commit CI and some of our thoughts about uh, how to improve that in FreeBSD land. Um, but now it's time for our next talk. So we're going to have Steve Kiernan from Juniper come to talk to us about Juniper's use of FreeBSD. So I'm going to turn it over to Steven. Okay, uh, well, let me start the video though. So you don't get to see me. <laughs> Everybody seeing the screen okay though? Yes, we can see okay. it just. All right, that's good. Uh, all right, so um, I'm going to talk about the history of FreeBSD at Juniper Networks. Uh, Juniper has been around for a little over 25 years now. This year was our 25th. Uh, anniversary of the founding of the company. And FreeBSD has been used for pretty much the entire time, uh, except for maybe like a, the first year when they were deciding what to, to actually do, what operating system they're going to run on. Uh, but it was pretty, pretty early on. So uh, I don't have a slide for talking about Juniper. And in case anybody doesn't know who Juniper Networks is, we make router switches, uh, firewalls, do cloud related things, uh, a lot of stuff for backhaul for 5G. And if it's networking, we probably do it. <laughs> so been around for a while. Uh, I've, been, I've been at Juniper since June of 2004. So it's been a little over 17 years. Um, my history for, oh, here, okay, here we go. <laughs> Start my video. There you can see me now. Uh, my history for FreeBSD, I've been using FreeBSD since the 1.1.5 days when I stole some uh, space off of my brother's hard drive on his computer to run FreeBSD during my college years. So it's been a, been a long time for me. Um, and I'll talk to, talk to you about what's been going on with FreeBSD at Juniper. So let's see. Here's the agenda. I'll, I'll show a timeline of uh, different eras, what we, from the engineering side, what we, uh, projects that happened and the errors that, that fit with those. So these are the, uh, the list of those, the early years, uh, this is, um, from the start of the company to probably about around Junos five. Uh, and then we had the three-way project, the turnpike project, the Autobahn project, Occam, Obelix, and then I'll talk about what our current plans are for that are actively being worked on and things that we want to do in the future. So 25 years of Juniper, as I said. Here's the, the early years was 1996 was when Juniper was founded. And in July of 1998, FreeBSD 2.2.7 came out. Juniper had started with uh, the two stable, stable two branch and had imported different versions of things over the years up, up through uh, the first release, which was September 1998, the M40 router came out. And then you had the FreeBSD 2.2.8 that was shortly thereafter. Uh, and in around that time, I don't know if it made it in the 2.2.8, I hadn't looked deep enough then to see, but PAM, the radius libraries and TACX plus and things like that came in. But you can see some other things be make and and then November 2000 FreeBSD 2.2. Uh, then we got into the freeway project and I'll, I'll go talk about each of these a little more. So I'm just going to go over this quick here the timeline. Junos 5.0 was in August of 2001. That was during the freeway project. Uh, then we had the FIPS, the first MIPS platform. Uh, FreeBSD 4.10 was after that, and Junos 6.4 was shortly after that. And the J series router, I'll explain why that's uh kind of significant there. And then we had in 2004, there was another product called Turnpike. Uh, Juno 7.3 happened then. Verified execution code came in. Juno 7.5 was in 2006. And FreeBSD 6.1 was in May of 2006, which then the Autobahn project used. Uh, and that's when Juno 8.5 had the results of Autobahn. And we went from, a, from CBS to Subversion, 
the first ARM v5 platform was in 2009 that we used. The first PowerPC platform we had was in 2010 with Junos 10.2. And then we had the first 64-bit x86 release was in uh, Junos 10.4. Occam, uh, I, I should say that, uh, so I started, I worked on Turnpike. So everything from Turnpike forward, I've, uh, I, had, I have had a hand in myself. Um, Occam was a pretty significant project, I'll explain why, but we went to uh, FreeBSD 9, then we had the MacBergs, their exact code, BMake was contributed to upstream. Uh, DRB and network NetSec module, I'll explain about that later. Uh, FreeBSD 10.1 came in and November of 2014, and then Junos OS 15.1. You can notice that the we went from Junos to Junos OS. There was a, a marketing name change then. And then in uh, 2016, there was the first ARM v7 release that we had. And then we moved to FreeBSD 11.1 when before we actually uh, uh, shipped the, the results of Occam, which was in 17.4. And then we had uh, work on the VertFS kernel driver, which I'll explain some of. There's been previous presentations about. Uh, and Junos OS 18.4 in December of 2018. And then we had our first ARM v8 release in Junos OS 20.2. Avalux was the most recent project that we had for upgrading through BSD, and that was to move to the to Stable 12. Uh, there was some work with LibSecureBoot, Lib and FreeBSD uh, 12.1 was in November of 2019. And it took us a little while before we had uh, the results of Obelix shipping in Junos OS 20 to that too. So now I'll just talk about the, give some details about these, these specific things. The early years started in 1996. That was the, the founding of the company. And the first release that came out was uh, based on FreeBSD 2.2.7. Junos at the time was two packages, the J kernel and J route package that were installed on top of FreeBSD. And there was a, the Junos CLI was a login shell and hid all the fact that you had FreeBSD underneath. So you'd install the packages and it would deal with, with all that. Um, but they were standard FreeBSD packages, 32-bit uh, x86, so i386 CPU was supported at the time. And the first shipping product was the M40 router, which you can see a picture of it there. That was in September of 1998. And very shortly after, uh, the Junos code moved to FreeBSD 2.2.8, just, just actually weeks within when 2.2.8 uh, was released. And in 2000, BMake was used for building. Uh, that code was integrated into upstream FreeBSD in 2012, but more about that later. And during this time, there were these contributions made in those early years. Uh, PAM support was added in 1998, contributed to FreeBSD, and the RADIUS and TACAX libraries were, were uh, also contributed as part of that. And the GDB remote debug protocol for uh, kernel was added then. And uh, now, so the first major project of upgrading FreeBSD was one called Freeway in 2001. And that one was a project to upgrade to FreeBSD 4.2 from 2.2.8. It was released in Junos 5.0 in August of 2001. And this is where we had a change from using standard FreeBSD packages where the files were just uh, written right out to the file system. And it introduced compressed ISO 9660 file system for packages. So all the package scripting was still using the FreeBSD package format. So you have the plus install, plus D install, and the plus require, things like that. So those would, would uh, decide whether or not things, certain things need to be installed or not. Those, that was used for quite a number of years. Uh, the contents for the ISO images were dictated by a manifest. And so it would, it would list where the sources came from, what, what, where they should live in the ISO. And the TCP IP network code, though, even though we we're moving to FreeBSD 4.2 during that time, the code in the TCP IP network stack uh, remained the FreeBSD 2.2.8 version. The first MIPS platform was supported in Q Q4 of 2001. Uh, that, that support was ported from NetBSD and OpenBSD sources. It was actually mostly OpenBSD. 
that was used at the time. And that was the RM7000A MIPS processor. Uh, the J-series router, when I was talking about before, why, why is the J-series router significant? It came in Juno 6.4 in August of 2004. And it, the main thing was it had RT Linux core support in order to have the packet forwarding side run as an application besides the rest of the OS acting as the, as the, the routing engine side. So the control plane, control plane was in the FreeBSD side of things, Juno's running um, as a task inside RT Linux core, or I don't know if they called the task or thread, I forget on that one. But uh, the, and then the forwarding side was an application that was running uh, besides it. That was, that was on an Intel IXP at the time. And there were follow-on J series that moved to other core, other processors because there was there was a limitations with the IXP. All right. So Turnpike uh, that happened in two thousand and four. That was a project to upgrade to FreeBSD four point ten. Uh, it was called Turnpike because they they consider it to be the the uh, smaller version or the the son of Freeway. Uh, and it was released in Juno 7.3 in August of 2005. And, uh, oh, actually this, I think I, this was this, that introduction of compressed ISO file systems, that was from the other one. I forgot to delete that. So <laughs> ignore that part. Uh, the TCP IP network stack code was updated to 4.10. So instead of running the 2.8, 2.2.8 version that was there before, that one had some upgraded. Uh, the interesting thing with uh, Turnpike is it was actually done by about six people. Uh, I was involved with handling the entire the user space side and the other five people dealt with the build and packaging and the kernel level side of things. So um, it wasn't too bad. It, it took, a, took a couple, about a year and a half, I think, to, to do. And um, that was the last of that. So uh, the verified execution code that came in in September of 2005, uh, Simon Garrity had done that work. And it, it came, was originally obtained from NetBSD. So the Net, NetBSD had the very exact implementation. And it only, what it does is it only allows you to run binaries or open files that match a fingerprint or a hash in the kernel database. And there's been many changes since uh, the old verify flag was added to be able to open a file from a program. You could say that I want you to validate that this is verified. And then we had some changes, some optimizations that were done because of the, the fact that we use ISO 9660 uh, images for our packages. We could also, instead of having to calculate the fingerprint the, for each executable that you run, and match that against the, uh, the database, we could verify the entire ISO. And if the program that you're trying to run comes from that ISO, which is, it's a read-only format, you can't modify it once the ISO is mounted, then you don't have to go and match the hash of the program because the entire package, the mounted package is, is already validated. So that was one of the other changes that we did. Autobahn uh, came in 2006, and that was a project to upgrade to FreeBSD 6.1. It was released in Genos 8.5 in November of 2007. There was uh, a lot of use of Giant that was needed in many parts of the code, and um, the Genos network stack had a lot of SPL level uh, uh, calls, and many of those needed to be replaced with locks where necessary. Uh, there was a little bit of time where there were some pieces of the code, the, the bits that needed to talk to the packet forwarding engine that didn't have locks, and there were some issues that were, were found because of that, and, but those, those were fixed, those were found and fixed. And there are, there are actually still pieces of SPL calls lingering in, in some corners of code, but they're no ops, so they don't really matter uh, in that case, but it's, it's just a little bit of historical cruft hanging around. Uh, in 2009, we switched from CDS to Subversion for source control management, and that was was a was a good improvement for things because CVS was getting unwieldy, 
the uh, Juno's code base was fairly large at that point, and uh, it was it was it was becoming problematic with merges and such. So uh, Juno's 10.1 released in February of 2010. That was where the first ARMv5 platform was supported. And we've had a number of ones since then. Uh, Juno's 10.2 added the first PowerPC Book E, the E500 platform. There, were, there was another set of platforms that based on the E5500, which is a 64-bit capable PowerPC, but it was running in 32-bit mode for those platforms. Uh, that, that came not that long after that. And in Juno's 10.4, which released in December 2010, we had our first 64-bit x86 release. And that was only really possible with us having moved to FreeBSD 6.1. So that was the, uh, for, for anybody that's familiar with, with Juniper hardware, uh, that was the MX series routers with the K2 RE or the RES 1800, which had, we had, ones that were shipping that had two core and four core, but prior to 10.4, you only were using one core. So from the Autobahn time and, and in that era uh, and, and some in that time after, there were a lot of contributions to FreeBSD. Uh, I picked out the key ones. There were a number of bug fixes and other things that aren't on this list. So the 32-bit uh, PowerPC kernel core file support for libkvm was added. Uh, there was MIPS support for gprof and thread debugging. Uh, kernel profiling for PowerPC, that was AIM and Book E. Uh, Marcel Moulinard did those that work. The CFI driver came in. Um, mini dump support for 32-bit ARM, which was contracted through semi-half. And for PowerPC, that was contributed. GDB server support for ARM and PowerPC. Uh, FPA floating point on format on ARM, which doesn't get used anymore. Uh, and that ISR statistics in NetStat and network stack parallelism improvements, those were together. That was sponsored development. We had Robert Watson do some work to improve parallelism in the network stack. Um, because uh, before that work, most of the network stack pieces uh, you're pretty much doing something that was equivalent to giant in all the cases. So, and uh, that there was a lot of problems with uh, being able to parallelize things. There's there's been changes that have been done since for that. There were core file enhancements. That's when compressed cores happened, and there are event handlers that are available when core files are being written out, so you can tell the progress of that. And then there was uh, some of the format uh, patterns where you can say for a uh, application core, uh, some of the percent percent I think was one, and there was one other one I believe that was uh, added during that. There were a lot of improvements to make FS during that time. Uh, we had sponsored the NAND FS uh, NAND file system through semi half during this time. And we never really actually ended up using that though. <laughs> so uh, it was, there were a lot of products that uh, were planning on doing directly attached NAND that never really manifested to, to need it. The FileMon device driver came in. That's one of the things that are, that, that are helpful for doing uh, the, what would be the meta mode build with BMake, which I'll talk about some of that and point you at the presentation that Simon Garrity had done previously. So Occam, this was a really big project in 2011. At the time that we were planning for the Occam project, uh, Juno supported ARM, i386, MIPS, PowerPC machine types. So there was at least four different variants of MIPS and at least two different variants of PowerPC plus x86 and ARM bits. There are uh, many different packages to handle the various platforms, so pretty much almost every single platform had their own package that had different contents. So it was, it was getting a bit unwieldy to deal with that. Uh, SMP for the most part wasn't supported. I, I say mostly because there are a couple of platforms that were enabling SMP, even though it was FreeBSD 6.1. There are uh, many modifications to the FreeBSD code over the years and uh, that made upgrades take longer and longer. Uh, one of the things that, that I didn't have on the slide for the, the previous section about the uh, uh, Autobahn time. Even though it was FreeBSD 6.1, uh, 
uh, and, I, and I talk about here, some of the pieces of the code from 6.2 and above were cherry picked back into Juno. So there were things from various 6.x releases uh, from head at the time and seven and eight uh, that went back into Junos at the time. So there were, it was a bit of a hodgepodge of, of various FreeBSD pieces. Uh, there were changes that was, this, this just needed changes. There were necessary changes happening that needed to happen to make upgrading easier and contributing code changes back to upstream with less of a chance of conflicts or requiring entire rewrites. Uh, when we did the Autobahn uh, thing, I, I had talked about Turnpike where it took six people. Autobahn was about 20 people working on it. So it was getting harder to do upgrades it took a lot more time. It took a lot more people to do it. Uh, so the Occam was a project to re-implement Junos on top of a pristine and current version of FreeBSD. FreeBSD is provided as a pre-published component. The FreeBSD sources are in a separate repository from the rest of Junos sources. So that allowed to control, easy, easier control over who can get access to the sources. As a, and prior to Occam, there are a lot of hands in various places of the operating system. It was implemented in stages. We had a physical separation where we actually moved the FreeBSD sources out from the rest of the Juno sources. And then there was a logical separation where we added uh, useful interfaces between where if there wasn't something in FreeBSD that the, the Juno side needed, we would create some interfaces for that. SMP support on multi-core routing engines, the RE8 S1800 uh, was, was added into there too. So that while we were doing it on the, the 6.1 side of things, um, this really unlocked a lot of the potential of them. And then the giant lock that was used by a lot of parts of the Genos code was replaced with finer grain locks. And for various levels of granularity in that case. Uh, this was released in Juno 15.1, June of 2015. It initially started with FreeBSD 9 current, but the shipping version was based on FreeBSD Stable 10, nearly equivalent to the 10.1 release. Uh, only 32-bit and 64-bit x86 CPUs were initially supported. And I had said we had lots of products that were based on other things like PowerPC and MIPS and ARM, but none of those were supported at, for that time. A lot of those other platforms were starting to get end of life during that time. So the first RMB7 support was shipped in Junos 15.1 x53d50.2. Yeah, it's a long uh, <laughs> release number. Uh, June 2016, this was the EX2300 and 3400 switches, and it was based on FreeBSD 11 current. So even though our other products were shipping on something that was based on FreeBSD 10, uh, it, we had to use current because ARM support in 10 was not usable, really, for RMB7. So we needed to use something for 11, from 11, what was, what was head at the time when we started the project. And eventually 11, 11 shipped during the time that we were working on this, but we couldn't move to stable 11 at that point. Uh, RMV8 support was shipped in Junos 20.2 release. And uh, so we, or I guess, yeah, I guess I was saying it was in 10, but in 11 we even was, was a little bit uh, or yeah, 10 was a little bit hard at that time because we were still working on Occam at the time that we were doing the RMB7 one. RMB8 uh, shipped support shipped in Juno's 20.2 release. It required some backporting of ARM64 mock depth code from head to stable 11 that was done by Justin Hibbets because uh, the, even though where we had stable 10 didn't have really good RMB7 support and we needed to, to pull things from, from head, stable 11 didn't have um, very good ARM V8 support. I mean, it was there, but it wasn't at the level that we would want for a shipping product. So we had to pull stuff from head during that time. The VertFS kernel driver was added in 2018, and that's the Plan 9 file system support for virtual file system kernel driver. Uh, we have some platforms that run in cloud providers, and there are some platforms that actually have a Linux host and Junos runs in a VM. That was done mostly by platform teams that needed some drivers uh, that weren't, that vendors didn't have FreeBSD drivers and the complexity of the drivers either through, uh, they wouldn't give 
enough details to be able to re-implement the driver uh, or which I think a lot of people are aware of the challenges with vendors sometimes. Uh, so the compromise was they would deal with the packet handling side in Linux and everything else for the management plane would be in the virtual machine running in, uh, in QMU. So we needed some way, uh, they were used, started with uh, emulated IDE disks and the performance from that was really abysmal. So you needed something that was better. And the plan nine file system, VertFS, what's called VertFS, uh, was supported by QMU and Linux had support for it in the kernel. And there were user space drivers through things like uh, Fuse that you could access uh, VertFS or you could there, you could use different transports. This was this is VertIO based transport and, and not some of the network based transports. So there's a, there was a presentation done at Meet BSD about this and we have sources available on GitHub and we're working on getting that upstreamed. Uh, Junos 18.4 is where the support for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, VMware, and some other uh, cloud providers. This is with the VSRX 3.0 platforms. And there's a, there's a lot of work that's been done for that. And we have more and more coming on the virtualization side. Uh, the, the contributions during Occam, the, there's the DRV API that allowed us to, uh, along with the network stack as a module work, allows for us to reuse FreeBSD network drivers with both either the FreeBSD network stack or the Junos network stack. Uh, Junos network stack uses a hierarchical uh, order of interfaces and has a lot of uh, additional protocols that aren't supported by the FreeBSD network stack. So the, we, there's, there's plans to try to move forward. Um, there's plans to try to, to pull things from one side or the other, but it's, it's a challenge when you have at this point, you know, almost at the point of where we did that work, uh, it was more than 20 years worth of historic code sitting in the network stack and trying to, to change that is difficult. Uh, uh, the Mac very exec module. So the verified execution stuff that I talked about before that was converted to a Mac module then that's since been contributed to FreeBSD and there's more work on that that will be coming in the future too. Uh, BMake was contributed to uh, FreeBSD uh, to be used in the build, and that's the meta mode support. There were presentations done at, at BSD CAN about that. Uh, Simon did one, Simon Garrity in 2014, and I think Brian Drury did one in 2015 about the builds. Uh, load, there were loader changes then, package FS support that was adding the install command where you could have a tarball of things that you want to install and the loader can boot that up. You can have a kernel and, and a user space ISO image to be used as the root file system. Uh, LibXO library was contributed by Phil Schaefer. That uh, allows for binaries to be able to output in different formats. Uh, user, just regular text or uh, XML or uh, JSON or anything you want to create plugins for to, to output. There were some HWPMC optimizations during that time, and also per thread HWPMC support was added and contributed. In an earlier version, there's some updates and better in progress and will be contributed soon. And then ARM hardware watch points, they have a sponsored development that we had semi half to. That was for the 32 bit ARM side of things. So Obelix was our most recent project, and that was to upgrade to stable 12. And it shipped in Junos 21.2 that was supporting i386, AMD64, ARM, and ARM64 machine types. It also upgraded us to LLVM 9, and we've since gone to LLVM 10 in Junos 21.4. There was this supported more than 40 Juniper platforms in routing, switching, access, and security. And the network stack moved from the legacy TX, which is a single queue, to multi-queue. And there were a number of changes that were required due to the IFLIB in introduction into network interfaces. Uh, Simon also did the, uh, Simon Garrity did verified execution loader, which extends the very exec functionality to the loader. And libsecureboot was contributed to FreeBSD as part of that. 
and I know he's working on some of the other things uh, for the e-loader. Uh, Octeon 64-bit support was added uh, is in our tree and because we have some the SRX 300 series are Octeon based 64 bit and that's uh, stuff that that uh, Justin Hibbett's been working on. So during this time with contributions to FreeBSD, there was a KVM clock driver with BDSO support that was sponsored through Clara Systems. Uh, original code was uh, Brian V did that and I took that and, and brought it forward and then we had Clara do add the uh, VDSO support. And uh, VertFS kernel support is uh, in progress. That's uh, it's out on our GitHub and it's going to get contributed. And then we have uh, sponsored work from Clara for live core dump. That's currently in progress. That should come soon to uh, FreeBSD. And now this is our current plans. We're gonna do Continuous integration of the FreeBSD main branch. This is the periodic syncs from upstream Git repo, automated build and testing, and additional addition of test case for OS stability. So taking what there is already there uh, in the existing tests that are in FreeBSD and expanding greatly upon that. So those we, we plan to contribute those back when we have all those finished. There's some that have been already done, some things that are in progress, and some that are planned. This, uh, we have a 3BC stable 13 upgrade. I know some people ask, uh, why do we keep stay on the stable branch? Part of that is uh, getting people to get over the fear <laughs> of being on, on head or main now. Uh, I'm working on that. <laughs> so, but uh, so far we, we release on stable and we'll, we'll probably be releasing based on stable in the foreseeable future. But this will all be done with that continuous integration also. So we'll be pulling things into from the main branch and we'll also be pulling things from stable. But uh, the thing that will change with the stable 13 upgrade is when, and, and stable 14 when we go to that, is any of the, the branching that we do for releases will be pulled off of our, our tracking of the main branch instead. So whatever the equivalent hash is, we will, we will pull off of there so that we have better parentage for things. Uh, there's kernel debugger security improvements that we have contracted with Clara for. Uh, this is this right now with Junos, when you have a shipping release, the kernel debugger is not available when Verexec is enforcing. And there are things where in customer deployments, you would, you would like to have some commands that you could use for uh, debugging things in the field. And, but a lot of the DDB commands allow you to put in arbitrary addresses. So that's, becomes problematic if you have things like keys in kernel memory. So there's improvements that are going on in there. Uh, there's debugger Python scripts. So if you ever, I don't know, if a lot of people aren't aware that GDB and LLDB have uh, Python scripting available inside them. We've had a number of Python scripts for GDB for a while now, and we're working on support to make them uh, agnostic to the uh, debugger that they have underneath. And the intention is to contribute that stuff up, whether it'll be a port or something that could be uh, into the main tree that's to be determined yet. Uh, kernel sanitizers for ARM, that's, we're working with Clara for that. Uh, Vert.io visibility and scheduler visibility tools. This is uh, uh, where we wanna be able to, to show what's going on at the time and historically what has happened. So for Vert.io, it becomes a challenge on the guest side when you have a, uh, Genos or FreeBSD in a guest uh, to know, is it the guest's fault that something is happening going wrong on Vert.io or is it the host? And so it's, it's I've, I've done some changes myself for um, adding dtrace probes in the Vert.io side in the Vert queues. There's some additional tooling that we have and planned using that, those dtrace hooks or, um, and uh, some additional processing along with uh, potentially KTR that you could see what was happening in Vert.io and be able to map your rights to specific file systems for the VertFS case and for um, packets that are going over Vert VTNet devices uh, and be able to see what's going on and are things getting stalled or, or taking a while. Now the scheduler visibility tools is, is to get uh, record, we want to do some things of recording scheduler activity. 
So you can, if you have something like a, um, something with deadlock from a locking problem or performance issues, or you have a, a thread that's starved for a while, how can you tell what, what caused that from a scheduling perspective? So there's, there's some work that's being done on that. And we're maintaining the fourth loader. I don't know people say like, well, you have the lure lower now. Why do you, why do you want, don't want to go and move to that? One thing is with the, with the verified, the VE loader, the verified execution loader, uh, it's too large to fit the Lua loader with the VE loader functionality in on some architectures. And we've got years of the fourth loader being used. And uh, there are packages that have that contribute fourth as part of that. So in order to, to support those, and we tried to be as, as far backwards compatible as we can, uh, you would either have to have a fourth interpreter impl uh, implemented in Lua or some other way to, to deal with those historically, uh, historical, historic images, I guess you could say, Junos images, because we need to be able to downgrade and upgrade. And, and so it, it, it's easier for us to just maintain it and it works for us. So there's, uh, there's upgrades that are going to be done for the version of Fickle in there. And there's a bunch of bug improvements that we have to work on. So that's the history. Uh, it's hard to get 25 years in 30 minutes, <laughs> but uh, there we go. Uh, these are some references to some of the presentations uh, that I referenced, uh, the BMake and MetaMode, Network Stack as a module, and the VertFS kernel driver. Um, I know for the uh, VertFS kernel driver, there was a presentation at Meet BSD 2018, but I'm not sure. I didn't see the recordings from that. That was one of the breakout sessions that you had. I know it was recorded, but I don't. I didn't, couldn't find a reference to it. So, uh, and then the network stack as a module. I don't know if there was a recording then, but if anybody's interested in knowing more about that, I have slides that I can provide. And, and that's it. Thanks, Steve. Um, there is one uh, question that I was asked on IRC, but it might be best to take offline. Uh, okay. Is that uh, I know in, in the FreeBSD land, we're very interested in having uh, pre commit CI. And so it might be worth, as you're working to develop your own notion, it might be worth to coordinate perhaps so that there is some stuff upstream that you can reuse in your infrastructure, reinventing two different things, if that makes sense for you. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for collaborating for that. Okay, so probably the best person to talk to that is Warner. So you might okay. want to talk to him offline about that. Um, but thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I knew some of the history, but not not quite all of what you shared. So that was very neat. So thank you. Again. It took a while to find a lot of these things because it's um, many many of the, especially as you go back in the years, um, many things are cloaked in internal names. So translating the marketing names of products to internal names and the timeframes, it took me probably about a week's worth of hours doing that. So, so it was challenging. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you again. And we're going to go ahead and take about a five minute break um, before our next session. So uh, we'll break for five minutes. If folks want to go ahead and head over to the hallway track, um, we'll be back here for our next talk after that. Thanks again.